Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno's Best Comics of the Week, and this is the show where I review all the comics I read this week in one show. We go least favorite to best pick of the week and everything in between. Uh, and of course, at the end of the video, we talk about the viewer's pick of the week, so in the comments below, let me know your pick of the week. So let's get started. I had 10 comics, and guess what? The topic of the video is actually going to be shown right in the beginning because I'm going to talk about The Amazing Spider-Man, issue 49. It's number 10. This is a Blood Hunt tie-in, which... Again, that's the topic being, do we need a tie-in for Amazing Spider-Man? Do we need as many tie-ins as we get with Blood Hunt? And the answer is obviously no. We don't need all these tie-ins, but the thing I guess that frustrates me with a tie-in in a main series, A, you're, you're kind of stopping the story. It's You have this filler story of like, hey, if you want to see what happens next that doesn't really pertain to the main series, go read this miniseries that you could have decided to pick up or not. Marketing-wise, it's smart, right? Because everyone's already reading Amazing Spider-Man. There's loyal fans like me that are would have been reading it for over a decade and will read every issue no matter what. And maybe, just maybe you'll hook somebody who wasn't normally interested in that miniseries and be like, okay, you know what? I want to pick it up. But again, it doesn't really have anything to do with this series or even really have to involve spider-man that much it's like oh you know how do we get spider-man in, into this story because we should have spider-man there'll be another tie-in with blood hunt that i think makes more sense that dealt with the event a little bit better and also you have the john ramita jr art that i'm not the hugest fan of and then the next issue have this big legacy issue so it almost really feels like that filler because you're like okay they're just waiting for issue 50 and they need this issue 49 filler so for me this this didn't quite do it i don't think you necessarily need to pick it up especially if you are not a hardcore amazing spider-man collector just just wait for the next issue and for me it made me decide that I don't want to get this miniseries and honestly I probably would have gotten the miniseries if it wasn't for this issue so you know it almost did the opposite effect of what it was trying to do so overall giving that one and a half stars and that is number 10. Moving on to number nine sadly another Spider-Man book and that is Spider-Man Shadow of the Green Goblin issue two. I guess frustrating about this is that there's a lot of potential, a lot of things I, I find interesting. You know, you have a, a lot of supporting ca characters that you normally don't get to see, at least in the main series. So you get like Gwen Stacy, you get this character of, of Harry's mother who plays a big part of this issue. But the artwork just feels very dark to me and it is very wordy. It, it's hard to get through. And you're kind of sold on this idea of this other Green Goblin and he's much more in the shadows than a main figure in this in this series, which makes it also again go to the idea of like there's a lot of potential there's something that's being scratched on the surface without actually doing the story without progressing the story and, and getting what is being sold to us so overall i'm giving it two and a half stars it's not a bad book it, it's just i don't know if it's giving me enough to want to pick up that next issue so that is number nine moving on to number eight which is birds of prey issue nine this is a book that i want to like a lot more that I've been enjoying it. I think the artwork improved here. It's a different artist and still has that unique style to the book because you you, you have this dreamlike sequence in this issue where they're trying to save Barbara and you find out the person there is not actually Barbara. But for me, I think the thing that I struggle with is I don't know if I love the chemistry of this team. You know, the Birds of Prey is so sold on chemistry and, and these characters. I don't know if that friendship has been built here because they keep going on these wacky adventures that don't pull in character as much even here it's more about Dinah and Barbara's relationship but they don't actually interact so it's hard to glob on to the relationship so overall I gave this two and a half stars and that is number seven now it's number eight actually number seven actually is a new title the boy wonder issue one I heard a lot of buzz about this and the reason I was really excited for for it is because it's a black label book that's not magazine size so I'm always happy about that and also it's a black label book that's not Batman yes it's Batman related but it's about Damian Wayne it's about the Bat family I'm like okay that's cool it I believe the artist and the writer is the same person as well yeah so it's all the same creator which is cool and this is not me saying this is a bad issue obviously none of these books I, I'm saying are bad issues because it's all about people's point of views but for me personally this just wasn't for me it's very manga styled it's actually kind of storybook-esque as well the right the way it's written which I'm not the hugest fan of there's elements I like like I like that Batman and Nightwing seem to have I'm um, Batman and Nightwing Batgirl and Nightwing seem to have a, a kid together and we get to see Damien kind of see his point of view where the family's at so I, I liked 
that i like that it was definitely a bit more artsy than you normally would get but i don't know if it was really again for me or honestly even scratching any surfaces that have not been explored before like we've seen alternate versions of nightwing and batgirl being happy together even having a family uh and maybe this would have been a little stronger if we got to see the kid it was just kind of mentioned in this issue so not for me but i'm sure it will be for people that are hardcore damien fans and people who do like manga and that style of art so giving that two and a half stars and that is number seven Moving on to number six, the book I was uh, alluding to before, tie-in, I think that was a bit stronger for Blood Hunt, and as Blood Hunt Dracula. Of course this is going to tie in more. Dracula is a bigger character in this event, and Blade's daughter has to do, of course, with a Blade event. So even if I didn't feel attached to it because I'm not really a fan of Blood Hunt, I don't even know if I'm going to continue it. I, I like this character already, so I liked her from previous books, so that helped. But then also, again, it just felt connected to something. It felt like this series was necessary to actually tell the story. And the artwork's really clean for it. It is double size, which I don't think was completely necessary, but there's a cool hook be in a cool humanity with Drac uh, with um, Blade's daughter, and then you have the villainess part, which is Dracula, who maybe is a villain maybe not is teaming up with blade's daughter so i i liked it i i don't know if it, i will pick up the next issue as someone who doesn't really know where i fall with this event but i i do think this is where you should go with the blood hunt tie-ins so that's number five for me or actually that might be number six that is number six so moving on to number five now which is Ain't No Grave, issue one, another bigger book. Actually, the pricing for this is, yeah, $6, but it is a, a rather big book. But it's honestly more visually intriguing. It's not really bogged down with a lot of dialogue, so it's also a rather quick book to get through. But it's about this woman, and this is very much a Western book, it's about this, this woman who has a cough, and you find out her story of why she has been dying and her connection to her family and what happened to her family, why she's alone. And now she's like trying to kill death, which I thought was an interesting cliffhanger. I'm like, okay, that might give me enough for issue two. But I will say the character itself and the backstory, I don't know if I was totally hooked on with this issue. I think they focus a lot more on ambiance, which is not a bad thing. It's just not really what I personally like in stories as much. I like to get in people's heads. And I, I feel like that was maybe a little bit more, uh, you had to read between the pages to kind of get the relationship a little bit more. But the artwork is splendid. The tone is really interesting. And it's a genre that is somewhat explored in comics, but not very often. And then obviously you have a, a pretty interesting cliffhanger to, you know, I think convince me at least to get an issue two to see where this goes, especially because I already trust this creative team from other books. So I'm going to give this three stars and that is number five. Moving on to number four, which is Transformers issue eight. I always say this, I'm not the hugest Transformers fan, so I'm sure this will be number one on someone else's list. But as someone who's a casual fan because of this comic, I like the, the humanity. I think you actually get back to humanity here where the characters get to rest a little bit and not fight. And, and we get to see, you know, Carly's point of view on things and Spike's point of view after all the trauma they've gone through. And as this kind of bigger war is going on against, you know, our good guys and bad guys, and I'm sure, again, there's other sprinkles of the 10,000 Transformers that are mentioned that I don't personally know, but I, I liked it. I thought it was a pretty solid issue from an emotional standpoint and also this, again, humanity story they've been trying to tell about how robots could be fascinated by humans. So uh, giving that three stars, and that is number four. Moving on to number three, which is Crocodile Black, issue one. This is interesting because it, it takes place during COVID, or at least, you know, you could kind of tell it's during COVID, which I feel like stories tend to not try to tell, and if they do, it's very ambiguous. So to have a story that really pointly blanks, tells you, hey, this is during COVID, I thought that was interesting. And you have this very morally gray character of, is he a killer? Is he a bad guy? And, and you get to see his thought process of, of different things and his menacingness throughout the book and, and his relationship with his family as well. So I feel like this was a pretty good intro. The, the, the dialogue was a lot of fun too. Like the, just the opener is about like, what's better McDonald's or Wendy's? And I'm like, okay, that kind of sucks you in. Cause it's a, it's a weird conversation to start a book off, but I kind of like that. It's like whimsical to start it off. The, the art is very watercolored, which I think fits very well for this as well. The muddiness of a crocodile, uh, book. So I, I definitely, Definitely gave me enough to want to read the next issue and and see where this goes so overall giving that three and a half stars and that is number three 
Moving on to number two. Happy to see this much higher, and that's Batman issue 147. I just felt like there was a cohesiveness in this issue that previous ones haven't had. And I think that's mostly just because the, the Bat family's kind of figuring out what's going on with Failsafe. There's definitely a connection between the Failsafe Amanda Waller relationship that's going to be playing a part in Absolute Power, which makes, you know, it, this world feel a little bit bigger. You obviously have Jorge Jimenez's artwork, so you have a lot of clean styles here. And, you know, it's not as much action heavy. It's more about like, oh, Damien finds out maybe the truth about Failsafe. Tim is teaming up with Batman. And, and maybe in some regards it's a little slower because of that, but I, I just feel like the plot itself and the characters are at least moving. So I like this one. I'm going to give it three and a half stars. And I thought this was better than some of the other issues we've been getting. Moving on to number one. This is my, was by far my favorite issue of the week. And that is Shazam issue 11. This is pure superhero fun and exactly what you're looking for in a Shazam book. The art is gorgeous. Like, it, it, it's just so beautiful and bright and works for this kind of cheery story. And then you have the really great juxtaposition of superhero and Civvy's life where we get to see the family trying to get adopted. We'll see if the government allows for, social, so, social services allows for it. And then, of course, there's a drama thrown in, a wrench that's thrown in, which is Billy's mom wanting him again, really. Like, okay, why is this happening? All the while, you have some Shazam adventure, of course, that's that's bringing some chaos. And then there's that interesting layer of Mary being 18. So how does that affect the story as well and affects the laws of the adoption and everything? So I liked it. I just thought it was a really well-balanced issue. And it, again, it just felt like an old school superhero comic. So uh, a perfect superhero book in my, in my mind. So I'm giving that four stars. And that is my pick of the week. Let me know in the comments below what your pick of the week was. And last week's viewer pick of the week was a blood hunt. And here are some comments about that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Gabaguno, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.